Well, good morning, Walden Church. We are back. It is Sunday. We are so glad to see all of you here. And I know it's been a couple of rough months, but uh, we're getting back together again and we're starting to fill up the pews and to see one another again. And it's just so great to be a part of this community and to be a part of this church family. So welcome, whether you're here uh, live with us or if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, we are so grateful to have you with us today. We are in the middle of a sermon series on the life of Joseph. And I chose Joseph not just because it's a story that has a plot, has characters, but also because Joseph is a flawed human being, right? Just like me. Joseph makes mistakes. Joseph has an ego. He's selfish. He hurts people close to him. I do all of that. I do that all the time. We all do. So what do we do about it? Do we wallow in self-pity? No. Do we blame other people for where we fall short? No. Instead, we should pick ourselves back up stay strong, remain patient, and we keep going. And uh, last we left Joseph, he was in jail. How does he get there? He's thrown into a pit by his jealous brothers, sold into slavery, shipped off to Egypt, right? And then sold to an Egyptian official named Potiphar. While working for Potiphar, Joseph becomes the victim of sexual harassment at the workplace, right? <laughs> to say the least. Uh, his employer's wife, she used her position of power to make Joseph an object in her eyes. Joseph was a toy for her, a game, a puppet, and he became less than human in her eyes. She was not, he was not an equal to her. But the Bible says, ultimately, he runs away from her. Potiphar's wife, again, she's angry because of that. She uses her control. She uses her persuasion and has Joseph thrown in prison falsely. But even as we closed out the lesson last week, we saw from Genesis 39, verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. And whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. No matter what happens in Joseph's life, God does not leave his side. And I think that can be a real worry for many of us. What, what if I take a stand? What if I do the right thing? People are afraid to speak their mind. They're afraid to stand their ground. They're afraid to stand up for the things that are true and for the things that they believe in. And honestly, we, we don't know how difficult this decision was for Joseph, the Bible doesn't say. It could have been easy for him, or it could have been the most difficult thing ever. But it doesn't matter, because the Bible tells us that when push came to shove, Joseph fled temptation. He literally had to run away to save himself. And many people right now in our world are afraid to take a stand. And we'll often say, well, what can I do? It's not my fight. Uh, you know, what difference can one person make? The life of Joseph, this story, is the story about what a difference one person can make. And the sad part is, Joseph knows it. Joseph knows his destiny. He knows that one day he will change the world but he's still growing and he's still maturing and he's learning how to step into who he's going to become when he's a man. But as I see him make this pivotal choice with Potiphar's wife, the other thing I see is that God 
rewards him for staying faithful, for staying obedient, for being patient. God rewards him. With prison? No, not with prison. The Bible says that God doesn't leave him. God takes this and turns it into blessing. God helps Joseph continue to succeed. Tell me something. Are you succeeding? Are you succeeding? Are you succeeding in your ministry? Are you succeeding at work? Are you succeeding at home with your family, with your kids? And if not, I would then ask the second question, why not? Are you being obedient? Are you giving honor to God through your time and your talents and your treasures? God doesn't make a whole lot of requests on us, does he? He doesn't ask for much. He pretty much gives us this beautiful park, this beautiful playground to play in, and all he says is, take care of it. You know, we're in charge. He asks that we take care of creation and that we love each other and that we serve, that we give a portion back to him and that we love him, right? I mean, what, what else is there? What else do we have to do? Just like Joseph, I have to ask myself every day, am I obeying? And when push comes to shove, am I standing up for my faith in the workplace, in the world, no matter what? Well, people might not like that. I might lose friendships. I might lose followers. Yeah, that's true, but Joseph lost years of his life in jail, right? When the, if you go back to like the rabbinical commentaries and you look up what the Jewish rabbis uh, estimate, they think that Joseph was in jail between 10 and 12 years. 10 and 12 years. Prison for something that he didn't even do. But because he did the right thing, instead of doing the easy thing, the Bible says God blessed him, even in jail. And we're going to continue reading his story in Genesis chapter 40. It says, sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. Have you ever noticed that if you ever feel like you're alone or you're the only one or the world is out to get you, suddenly God surrounds you with other people who are going through the exact same thing. Hey, what are you in for, right? Oh, uh, my boss's wife tried to take advantage of me. You? Verse five. And one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream, and each dream with it its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were both troubled, so he asked Pharaoh's officers who they were and why they were in the custody of the master's house. Why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we have had dreams and there was no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So what do we see happening? There's a dispute somewhere in Pharaoh's palace, the cupbearer is in charge of tasting all of the king's food and making sure that it's not poisoned. And then the chef is, of course, in charge of making the food. So obviously something these two men did made Pharaoh angry or made Pharaoh not trust them. So he throws them both in prison. Do we know why? No. But they end up in the exact same place where Joseph is. Do you think that's a coincidence? No way. Sometimes life might look like a coincidence, but other times it looks like providence. You can see God's hand working in your life and in the life of those around you. God's working in Joseph's life right now, behind the scenes, even in prison, and now with two men Joseph has never met. And they're all together in jail. Uh, the two of them have dreams. They need interpretation, and in walks Joseph. You know, just because we don't see 
God working right now doesn't mean God isn't working behind the scenes in your life. God is at work in your life and in the life of those around you. Yes, even when it's not obvious, sitting in an Egyptian prison, Joseph probably thinks his life is over, that, that he missed his shot, missed his big break. He put all his chips out on the table and he lost big time. Summer, we're heading into it. Summer is a very lonely time for me as a pastor. Y'all go on vacation. <laughs> Some of your uh, our, uh, uh, weekly activities take you away from church. Uh, our weekly activities go on hiatus or they stop. Uh, our school next door obviously is closed. And, but lately, with, with COVID, I think summer is going to feel even more lonely. So please, if you want to come by the church and you want to come by the office and talk about anything, uh, come bug me. Please come bug me. I'm here. I want to talk to you. So you're, you're not bothering me if you want to walk in and, and talk for five minutes or an hour. Okay, I'm here for you. But I'm sure that I'm not the only one that's going to feel this way this summer. Just like Joseph, he's not the only one in prison, right? In 2020, we lost things. In 2020, we lost a lot of things. What have you felt like that you've lost these past weeks? Are you experiencing financial loss, business loss, career loss? I have friends who have lost jobs or who are in fear of losing their jobs or who have got divorced. And when loss happens, you call out to God and you feel like your prayers are going up and they're unheard, unanswered. My prayer goes up, nothing comes back down. You feel abandoned, you feel alone, you feel rejected by the very God who promised he would never leave you or forsake you. But what do we see from Joseph? Don't give up hope. It's not over. God's still working, even behind the scenes. His ways are not our ways. No matter how ugly our situations are, God still has a plan. He's always at work. Verse 9 says, So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, This is the interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly, when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into this pit. So the cupbearer goes first, and he says, here's my dream. Joseph listens and says, good news, you won't be in prison long. Pharaoh's anger will die down, and you'll get your old job back, and hey, do me a favor. When you get out, can you put in a good word for me? You know, a little, hey, I scratch your back, you scratch mine, right? And before in the story, we had only seen Joseph use his gift to serve himself. We've only seen him interpret his own dreams. But now he's a little older. He's had plenty of time to think. And now he's probably a little bit more mature and he begins to see other people. And I want to offer a, a quick note here. I think so often we can look at the church as being about us and about having our needs met. We walk in and we walk out. It happens. It happens in this church, it happens at every church. You know, you find a church and you like the singing or you like the sermon or you like the, the kids' ministry and we come in empty and we fill up and then we leave. It's kind of like a spiritual gas station. 
But we're looking at Joseph because he's a real person and he's a flawed person. And I'll be the first, I'll say, just like me, just like us. There is something to be said about maturity. And when we begin to see other people in the room, when we begin to see other people in our life, and we start to ask them about their needs, how can I use my gifts to serve you? Church should be that place. Church should be a place of friends and family and acceptance. It should be welcoming. It should be warm. It should be affectionate. Everyone here has a story. You have a story. And we should try harder to listen to each other and to get to know one another and to smile more and to love more. How do you start that? I don't think we've met. That is the perfect way to start off a new conversation. Right? I don't believe we've met. I can't imagine wanting to socialize with other people in a prison. Especially Joseph, he's not a criminal, right? He's in prison with criminals, but he's not one. These people aren't like him, he's innocent. But listen, whether it's jail or a hospital or church pews, we are all in this together. That person that you met for the very first time, God might be working behind the scenes in their life and you may just need to listen to their dreams. They might need that word of hope that only comes from you. At Walden Church, we say it like this, every member is a minister. If you wanna know the first step to growing in your faith and the first step to mature as a Christian, it's beginning to notice the other people in the room. Verse 16 says, when the chief baker saw the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head, and in the utmost basket there was all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. Hey, there was good news for the cupbearer, so what about me, Joseph? What about my dream? Here it comes. Verse 18. And Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. And in three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat the flesh from you. And we don't have the rest of the story. We don't see the reactions of the other two. Uh, we don't even know if these other prisoners believe Joseph. But the Bible says that it happened exactly like Joseph said that it would. And maybe in prison, Joseph watches those two gentlemen leave, and then through the rumor mill, he hears that the cupbearer did get his old job back. And if I were Joseph, I'd be thinking, okay, God, I know what's gonna happen next. I made the cupbearer a promise that he would talk to Pharaoh, and I'm just about out of here. But what happens next? Verse 23 says, Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. You got one shot. Hail Mary. It's this or nothing. It's all riding on this. And if you turn the page and you look at the top of Genesis chapter 41, it says, After two whole years. Talk about disappointment. Instead of a quick release, we see in the very first verse of the next chapter that two more years go by. And what is Joseph doing? He's doing what he always does. He's staying strong, staying patient. But what a jerk. What a jerk the cupbearer was, right? I mean, going back on his word, forgetting his friend. But again, 
That's the humanness of this story, isn't it? People hurt people all of the time. We forget them. We use them. We're selfish in our relationships. What about God? Do we use God? Do we forget God? Do we forget the promises that we made God? Sure, all of the time. God, if you heal me, right? God, if you heal me, I will do this and this and this. God heals us and then what happens? Nothing happens. We go back to living life as we always did. God, I need your help paying bills. God, I need your help at work. Lord, help me with my marriage. And I promise I will, I will, I will, I will, what, what? I will be better, do better, do more. What happens? Just like the cupbearer, we forget. We didn't mean to. We didn't try to. It's just easy. It's easy to slip back into an old habit. It's easy to slip back into an old pattern. Last week, I said, give your whole life to God and claim his promises. Remember that? Give your whole life to God and claim his promises. How come we can't do those two things on a daily basis? We forget. My laundry list of to-do items is pressing and it's loud and it's in my face. I forget to do the things that I promised to do for God. There was a story in the Daily Bread devotional where a man was laying on his deathbed and the pastor came in to see him, came into his room. And the man on the bed said, Pastor Dan, I am in trouble. All my life, I read and knew the promises of God. And right now, in this moment, I can't remember any of them. And pastor Dan smiled and said, but do you think God's forgotten? Just like we see with Joseph, the entire world forgot about him, but God didn't. So I would remind you that no matter what you're facing right now, remember that God is in control. And if you don't see his hand, and you don't see his providence, it may be that he's just working behind the scenes. Romans 8 says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? God is for us. He demonstrated that very clearly when he sent his son to die on a cross for our sins. All you have to do is trust him with your life, your whole life. And then you just keep believing. Just keep believing. Just keep moving forward. Just keep being strong. Keep being patient, even when life is uncertain. It's the only thing that's going to keep you afloat. Can I give you just one other thing this morning? I want you to practice turning your trials into triumphs. Turn your trials into triumphs this morning. Be patient with God. Search him for the answers. If Joseph could survive all those years in jail, 10 to 12 years of mistreatment, I'm confident, I am confident that God can walk with you through your circumstances as well. God has not abandoned you. God has not forgotten you. We have to just keep being the best that we can be. I love uh, Martin Luther King Jr. He said it this way. He said, whatever your life's work, do it well. A man should do his job so well that the living, the dead, and the unborn could do it no better. If it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep the streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. 
like Shakespeare wrote poetry, like Beethoven composed music, sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. We do our job well by remaining faithful, remaining obedient, and being patient for God's timing. Turn your trials into triumphs and give God your whole life. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for the life of Joseph and for these words that continue to find relevance in our life. May we not just read this as a familiar story, but read it as our own story. We might learn a lesson that as Joseph matured, we also mature. We grow in faith and we grow in you. We grow in spiritual discernment. And we grow in our ability to see the needs of others and to reach out and to be a friend and to be a shoulder for those who need us. Lord, may this church be a light on a hill. May this church be the salt of the earth. May this church continue to minister to those who walk in every door. May we have eyes that see the things that you see and a heart that breaks for the things that break your heart. Lord, heal this world. This world feels broken with sickness and division. Lord, we know that only your healing hand has the power to restore all things. Lord, may we seek ways to tear down walls and to heal hearts and to heal flesh and bone and to give back life to this world to give back love to this world. May your church be grace. May your church be forgiveness. May your church be warm and accepting. May your church give hospitality and love in all things that she says and does. Protect us as we go forward this summer. Continue to offer your healing and grace to each one. And we ask this in your son's name, amen. Hey, thanks for being with us this morning. Thanks for spending the time. Uh, this sermon is recorded both as an MP3 on our podcast at waldenchurch.com and it's also available on YouTube. So please uh, save the link, clip and copy it and put it on maybe a friend's wall that you think might need to hear it. And we're here uh, at the office nine to three through the week. Please stop by and visit, say hi. We'd love to see you. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. I love you guys. Bye.